Before we dive in, uh, like all my talks, I have some notes. If you don't feel like taking notes during the talk, um, I was smart enough to make this uh, not all caps this time. That has burned me before. That is case sensitive. So when you type that in, and I put the QR code there, which was out of fashion for a while, but if you've upgraded to iOS 11, Apple has added QR code scanning in. So now our community is gonna go from QR codes, nobody uses those, to have you seen these things? They're awesome. <laughs> you know, we need a little introspection on our own community sometimes, that's fine. <clears throat> um, so yeah, here we are. Uh, what are we doing here? I definitely, before we dive in again, wanna thank Matt X. Oh, that's, that's the X, Matt. <laughs> We want to spread the word about Maddox and this conference, help it evolve. When you put Matt X into Google Images, you get all sorts of stuff. But eventually, eventually we get, there we go. So I'm just going to chat for a while with this big image of Matt. Uh, you know, thank everyone here. Thank you very much for indulging me for the next half hour. Thank you to the staff who are putting this on, and Matt, thank you very much for inviting me, having me here to speak. Congratulations on a third year of this conference. So yeah, round of applause for Matt. <laughs> I did love having a reason to come to Vancouver. Uh, I've been here once before, but it was so long ago that I've kind of forgotten, so beautiful city. I love coming here. When I was coming up here from the airport, I noticed there was a King Edward station. I thought that was a good omen, uh, but, <laughs> made me feel very at home. Uh, but then I found out you have a butt chart gardens. Um, <laughs> for this joke, I was gonna make a butt chart, but I figured <laughs> no good can come of that. <laughs> so to any of the locals, sorry about the Canucks this year. Tough breaks. Um, so what are we doing here? How to fail. Something uh, some of my coworkers might tell you I am qualified to speak about. Uh, this is not excerpts from Joe Chilcote's biography. Um, so when I was thinking about how to fail, um, usually when I give talks at conferences, I try to work with the conference, uh, the person who's putting it on, and this year I spoke with Matt a bit, and this is my first time at this conference. And I said, I always hear Mac DevOps is very technical, should I do a technical talk? And he said, you know what, we have a bunch of technical talks. Um, why don't you do something on process? So. How to fail came up, and I hit up the Mac OS X dictionary. I guess that's the Oxford dictionary. I don't know if that's what's built in. Uh, what cracked me up about these definitions is not only do they give a, uh, a, a definition, but they give an informal definition. So verb, fail, informal, flop, bomb. <laughs> Antonyms, succeed. Yeah, it's the opposite. That's what we want. We want our systems to succeed. Um, they give this other example. The ventilation system failed, and again, the informal ones are great. Conk out, go on the blink, go on the fritz. Antonym, work, yes. We want our systems to work. We want to succeed. Um, but failure is very often um, seen as a negative thing, but you know, we want to put a positive spin on that and say it's something we can learn from. So how do people fail? Now, you normally think I'm talking about technology here, but it's pretty much always about people, right? Um, we created all this technology, we're imperfect, the technology we create is imperfect, so when our technology fails, it's usually a failing of people to foresee that even a system that's in place and working right now is gonna have problems in the future for whatever reason, a component dies, uh, more human error. Uh, you know, we created these things in the first place, so they're not perfect. Um, and I know Papayan uh, referenced this a little bit earlier, but as an example of human failure, a few weeks ago, the people at Panic announced their source code was exfiltrated. Um, I want to look at this from the human side of it. Um, for those of you who might not have heard Papayan's uh, description of this, um, or who don't know Panic, Panic, bright group of people, they've been around writing Mac software since the days of classic Mac OS. They've been at this a long time. So not only are they really smart, um, but they're really familiar with the Mac platform. And um, one of the people in the company downloaded uh, the malware-infested version of Handbrake, the video encoding application, and you wonder, how did this happen? So you scroll down a bit and you start reading 
what happened. And he says, I managed to download within the three-day window, which the infection was unknown. I managed to hit the one download mirror that was compromised. I managed to run it. That doesn't sound like a high bar. Um, and breeze right through an, in retrospect, sketchy authentication dialogue without stopping to wonder why Handbrake would need admin privileges or why it would suddenly need them when it hadn't before. I also likely bypassed the gatekeeper warning and on and on and on. So this is a really bright person, clearly had his blinders on, wanted to get from point A to point B uh, and get his work done. So not to pick on Panic or Stephen who wrote this up. I'm so happy they wrote this up. This was uh, a, a really nice thing to share and um, uh, it must have been difficult <laughs> to sort of write and admit. So that was really nice. But we've all kind of seen uh, this type of thing before. We know the saying, some human made that decision to close this chain link with uh, you know, a piece of plastic that I could probably open up with a pair of nail clippers or something. When we talk about reliability, the opposite of failure, we very often talk about it in terms of nines, five nines of reliability. Um, you can do this five nines of reliability. Uh, <laughs> it's easier to talk about this reliability in terms of uptime. This is 36 days of uptime a year. Pretty easy to hit. Um, the point here, though, is just going from these five nines, basically 9%, to 99.9, .9, which is uh, a little over eight hours of downtime a year. That sounds pretty impressive. But to even go from this to the real five nines, which is a little over five minutes of downtime a year. Um, each one of those steps means we need to invest more in our people, we need to invest more in our infrastructure. So each of those steps really raises the bar, uh, even going from you know, the 99.9 .9 to 99.9999. Um, so we've talked about failure. What can fail? What are we interested in in failing? Big systems. Big systems can fail, and that's going to be really the focus of this uh, talk. Uh, big systems can fail either in their entirety or sometimes a small piece of a larger system can fail. And uh, here's an example of a large system failing. I'm going to pick on it a few times today, so if there's anyone from Amazon here, I'm really sorry. You do great work. Um, but the thing about Amazon uh, having a failure is that so many other companies rely on them. Uh, I've heard a bunch of talks between yesterday and today and people talking about S3. Um, so here's an example of a large system failing, and I'm going to get back to that a few times. One thing I'm not going to cover in great detail, but I feel I would be remiss if I didn't mention, user-facing systems. We here in this room, you know, DevOps, um, we create systems for our end users to use, and um, Sometimes we fail them because we create systems that are not easy to use or they're not obvious uh, to use. We've all kind of seen dialog boxes like this. Um, my favorite version of this dialog box is the one that pops up to me and the last line says, see your system administrator for details. I'm like, I'm the si I got nothing. <laughs> I can't help you. So instead of dialog boxes like this, we need to very often do better for our end users. Um, so, things fail. What can we do about this? Here's the heart of what I'm trying to get at. One, set up an environment for failure. Um, give yourself and your coworkers and your team space to play, a playground where you can wreck stuff and kick things over and erase data and not have to care about it. Um, the reason you do this is because people need space to uh, write proof of concepts and test code, and if you don't have a space for people just to play around with, they're going to do it in production, and that's never a good idea. Um, this can be as easy as a virtual machine on your local workstation, or it might be something that uh, helps you mirror production, uh, so it's a larger test system, uh, but you need something like this in place. Configuration management. This is sort of an extension, I think, of having a playground. Um, configuration management does a lot of things for it. I think we've all been over it between yesterday and today. Um, but one thing that does for me is it makes me a little less worried about changing something on my machine. So I know 
I sometimes I'm curious and I say, wow, there's this profile. Is it getting in the way of me doing this? I'll just go delete the profile, because I know Puppet, in our case it's Puppet, could be Chef, could be Casper, whatever, is gonna come back along and correct all that for me. So configuration management helps you be a little bit more fearless, I guess. Um, monitoring and alerting. Um, we've had a few good talks on monitoring and alerting. I like to wrap them both up together. Um, monitoring's great. We collect all this data from our fleet. We collect so much information, we can make these nice charts and graphs. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that no one sits and looks at a dashboard all day. I mean, I guess you could hire someone to do that, but they're gonna fall asleep at some point. Um, so you want alerting tied in with this, that when um, things go out of a certain threshold, that you're automatically alerted, you're paged, whatever your alerting mechanism is. Um, it might sound obvious, but don't make your monitoring and alerting systems reliant on the things they're monitoring and alerting about. Um, so yeah, sounds funny, but back to my example. Um, this is just in February of this year, and I hope Amazon has cleared this up because I find this a huge misstep. There's a link to this report in the notes. Um, if you scroll down, you will find out that they say they could not update the health dashboard um, because the administration console has a reliance on S3. So they couldn't let you know that S3 was down because S3 was down. Uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of a misstep. So don't make your monitoring and alerting reliant on the things that they're monitoring and alerting. Stage rollouts, we just heard a great talk about staged rollouts. Um, uh, we like to get a bit more granular with our staged rollouts, but staged rollouts um, help you contain the damage um, before it gets too widespread. Um, you know, at Google, you know, uh, sometimes we are slowly rolling something out to all of our machines, slowly. It might even hit half the fleet, which is 45,000-ish machines at this point, and everything's great. And we say, great, the next step is we're gonna roll this out to 70% of the fleet, and that's when someone screams. You know, it, it surprises us that we can get to that many machines, um, and no one saw a problem until it got to this even larger number, uh, but that gives you the chance to then say, okay, it's just this one person or this small group of people and they're doing something really funny. Uh, we can continue with the rollout or it gives you an opportunity to realize, oh, if we go to 100%, we're gonna destroy some people and let's fix this and re-roll out. Documentation, oh yeah. As techs, we love good documentation. As techs, we hate writing documentation. Uh, it's just one of those things. But uh, you need to get your documentation house in order um, when you're preparing for failure. So your documentation should be written in a way that a new person on your team, without your team's help, can do basic things with a service, start, stop, et cetera. The most important part of your documentation, though, is a playbook for when things go wrong. And again, a new person on your team should be able to see an error, go look it up in your documentation, and either fix that service or know who to report it to or kind of figure out what's going wrong. Automation, it's kind of part and parcel of all this, but it's worth mentioning that um, the more you can automate, the better. Automation can react faster than a human. Um, it might even save you from getting paged. Uh, we have some systems at Google that um, if there's a certain error threshold that gets passed after a release, it can automatically roll back to a previous known good state. Um, and then you, know, you can continue your uh, family event or sleep or whatever it is you were doing when things kind of went off the rails. Testing. In this case, I'm not talking about, well, it built and ran on my machine, it works. Uh, I'm talking about disaster recovery testing. And um, disaster recovery testing can come in uh, sort of two flavors, uh, theoretical and practical. Theoretical tests, you're pretty much just emailing a person or phoning them up and saying, hey, this system's down, what would you do to fix this? And usually this is a test of your documentation. That's the first thing that they're gonna reach for. Um, and hopefully they can tell you how to get your service back going again. The practical tests are when you really take a server down. 
sometimes you don't want to actually shut things down. You firewall it off from your network, but you really take this thing away from production. And um, it's amazing when you do that, how many dependencies you discover that are on this system. And that's usually not good. If those things are there for a reason, you document them. Uh, if they're not there for a reason, you fix them. Um, back to my S3 example a little bit. When S3 has a problem, I, I don't remember how many companies then you know, have to put up a web page that says, sorry, Amazon S3 is down, so we're also down. Um, however, there's one company that is well known for using Amazon S3, and when S3 has a problem, they don't go down. That's Netflix. Netflix has this year-round, 24 by 7, uh, rolling disaster recovery test ca called Chaos Monkey. So Chaos Monkey is a service that just knocks servers offline and takes them down, makes sure the service is still running, Netflix as a whole is still running. If it is, great, bring that server up and then knock another one offline. So it's in this way um, that they know how their infrastructure reacts when there is a problem. So when there's a real failure, they pretty much have a good idea of what's wrong, how their infrastructure works. Uh, and they have an entire page on this called Chaos Engineering, or Principles of Chaos Engineering. There's a link to that. But I like their description. Chaos in practice, it addresses the uncertainty of distributed systems at scale. So that's exactly what they're doing. There's also a link to uh, Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey is open source from Netflix. So thank you, Netflix. It's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know if anyone here has written a service that just knocks servers offline. Uh, if you have, were you, were, yeah, were, you, were you praised for it? I don't know. It's, it's a pretty bold strategy, right? So that's great. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the uh, Google SRE book, uh, How Google Runs Production Systems. It also goes into some topics like this, like managing risk and you know, balancing uh, failure, et cetera, et cetera. So those are most of the things that I think you can do to prepare for failure. I will be the first one to admit, I might not be great at doing all of that stuff myself. I will admit that. But I'm trying to improve. So how am I trying to improve? Two things that I think are really, really useful in this quest to improve. One, checklists. Um, checklists are fantastic. I should also say templates, right? Templates that you just fill out, similar to a checklist. Before you think checklists are beneath you, doctors use checklists, pilots use checklists, uh, a whole host of people whose jobs are probably much, much more important to their clients than mine, use checklists. It's a way that you don't forget things. Um, and the great thing about checklists and templates is that they're living documents. So when procedures change or you realize you forgot something, you add it into the checklist. Um, after forgetting some chargers, um, on trips, I now have a checklist when I pack. <laughs> and it gets checked off when things actually go in my suitcase because there have been too many times where I get to my hotel and I say, oh, I need my chai, don't remember actually putting it in. And then I talk to my wife and she says, yeah, you left all your chargers on the couch. I'm, yeah, yeah, I know. So checklists. Um, if you want more information about checklists or need more convincing, there's this fantastic book, The Checklist Manifesto. Someone's read it, that's good. Um, it's a fantastic book, it's really well written, very compelling, good stories. Um, I love the subtitle, How to Get Things Right. That's really, really true. You should even pick it up, maybe uh, read it on your ride home, your plane flight. I mean, up on this screen, don't worry about it. It looks enormous up on this screen, but Amazon has this great guide. It's only like eight inches tall, so it'll fit in your luggage. Don't worry about it. How strange is that that they provide that? Who cares? <laughs> The second thing I would do um, that I would like to share is have someone to run your ideas by. I think this is really important. And a lot of us at larger companies, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, uh, probably Amazon, et cetera, this is sort of codified into the way we work. If you want to uh, check in new code, you need to get your coworker to look at it and approve it. Uh, if you're designing a whole new system, you write a fairly formal design doc, share it with people, get their feedback, make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, but if you are a smaller organization or uh, you're an in individual consultant or something along those lines, 
I think there's always someone to talk to. I say it all the time, the Mac and Apple admin community is the best in the world. And I know we've talked about Mac admin Slack a bunch of times. Um, I think people in Mac admin Slack would be really happy uh, to look at a document from someone, or if a document is too much, uh, if you just popped into Mac admin Slack and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing, here's how I'm thinking about doing it, is that a good idea? Uh, does anyone have any suggestions? Um, so have someone to run your ideas by. I think that's really useful. Um, and there are some other ways too. I know uh, in the Bay Area there's MacBrained. Uh, in New York we have Mac Admin Monthly. We would love it if you came in and asked a question like that. I'm thinking of doing this thing. Uh, does it sound like a good plan? Um, so Benjamin Franklin said, supposedly, I wasn't around to hear this, so I'm taking it on good faith, that he said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. So I love that quote. Um, having a plan typically staves off a lot of failure. However, I'm not a fan of plans getting in the way of actually doing work. There needs to be a bit of a balance. Has anyone heard of the marshmallow challenge? Has anyone ever heard of this? I see you know, one or two hands. Yeah, so the Marshmallow Challenge is a team building exercise. I hate team building exercises. But there's some interesting things that came out of the Marshmallow Challenge. And uh, again, there's a link to this with some of the results. The Marshmallow Challenge uh, is uh, you, you split up people into teams of three or four people. And they get 20 sticks of spaghetti, uncooked, so it's rigid. Uh, one yard of tape, one yard of string, one marshmallow, and 18 minutes to build the tallest freestanding structure that they can. Um, so freestanding, it can't be braced up against the table, they can't hold it, or something like that. The only rule is that the marshmallow has to be on top. The people that do the best at the marshmallow challenge are structural engineers. Maybe not a surprise. The people that do the absolute worst at the marshmallow challenge are MBA graduates and MBA students. <laughs> the people that do the best, or you know, second best, but very, very close to the best, are grade school students, typically kindergartners. Um, they usually get it right. Um, and if they don't get the same height as the structural engineers, it's usually much more creative. And at least it stands up. Um, the problem here is that the MBA students take their 18 minutes and most of the time they're writing their plan. They're trying to figure it out. And of course time is running out and now they say, well you need to build stuff and they start building stuff and time's about to run out and they jam the marshmallow on top and <laughs> the whole thing collapses. The grade school students, what do you think they do? They just grab the marshmallow and start jamming spaghetti sticks into it and they build something. So I, I'm not saying that you should just build something, but there needs to be a bit of a balance. Don't let planning get in the way of your proof of concept or sitting down and writing some code. So, you've done everything I've said. You've prepared, you've made checklists, you've done all these things. You're ready, but oh my God, shit just blew up. <laughs> things went off the rails. <laughs> What do you do? Yeah, this was a big, this was a big one. Um, first, stay cool. When there's a problem, it's yelling and getting nervous, uh, not gonna help anybody. So, rule number one, stay cool. You're not looking for the scapegoat. You're gonna stay cool and you're going to try to get this thing fixed. You'll figure out the other stuff later on. The next thing. No one gets fired. This is not a fireable offense. We're humans, we make mistakes. Of course there might be exceptions to this rule. Um, someone did something very willfully, or you know, there could be problems with this. But in general, people make mistakes. Honest mistakes happen. So, no one gets fired. But, this person that made a mistake, that just didn't get fired, has to write a postmortem. Uh, and they might get help from the team or something like that. But the postmortem tells what happened, why it happened, and most importantly, how it's not going to happen again. Um, and sometimes that's just process. Um, hey, we realized we were doing things out of order, we've updated our documentation, or we've updated our checklist, that's gonna fix this problem. 
or it might be more serious. It might be an actual technical problem. So uh, you will have a list of bugs, and you get to say in your postmortem when this list of bugs is fixed, uh, this won't happen again. Something else will happen, but those, this thing won't happen again. And I'm just going to take a second here before I wrap up entirely and say only you can prevent forest fires. And by forest fires, I mean failures. And the key word here is you. We work in an industry that almost promotes burnout, uh, that is very easy to get caught up and uh, not treat yourself uh, very well sometimes. I think we're turning a corner. There are a lot of companies that talk about life work balance and so on. Um, but you really need to watch out for yourself because most companies, no matter what they talk about, um, you still have to be the one in charge of maintaining yourself. And I'm not saying go become a triathlete and watch every calorie you eat, um, but uh, Aaron Hillegas, who has written the Coco Programming Guide, that's basically the Bible of Coco Programming, I think he's up to his fourth or fifth edition now, has included this passage in every single edition. The first trick to maintaining focus is to get enough sleep, 10 hours of sleep each night while you are studying new ideas. Before dismissing this idea, try it. You will wake up refreshed and ready to learn. Caffeine is not a substitute for sleep. Now, you know yourself, maybe 10 hours is a lot, maybe you need seven, eight, but I guarantee two, three, four is not enough and it's gonna catch up with you, so take care of yourself, please. We like you. Um, so, just to summarize and wrap up, if I walked into a company today that had none of this in place, first thing, documentation. You gotta know your baseline, you have to know where you are. Um, then I would get a test environment set up so people can kick the tires without fear. Um, I would get configuration management in place, and then I would start doing disaster recovery testing. And with that, I thank you very much. Ooh. I spoke fast. It's I ran failing. over in all my tests. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. Any uh, questions? Oh, yeah, there's one. Personal stories of tragedy. <laughs> Where did you find that cool flicker effect? Uh, well, anytime I give a presentation, I have to spend a few hours in Apple Motion, so I made it. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Respect. That's Respect. what I do. Questions? It's usually either a song in Logic or something in Motion, so. <laughs> Any Love other? Me. Questions related to failure. <laughs> There's one in the back. Microphone coming over. Good to see you. It's the long microphone pass. This is a great talk. I appreciate it. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, I've caused a bunch of production outages at Uber. It's not fun, but yeah. I've been there, and we do a lot of the things that you're talking about in your talk. Um, but we struggle with outage communication internally and sort of like uh, fostering that good communication amongst teams sort of as a standard. And I think that's a problem that a lot of places have internally, even when you build tooling around having good communication. What's your experience at Google and you know, how are you doing that to foster that, that culture? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question. Um, our support organization is really sort of, uh, we work very closely with our support organization. So we have um, known incident pages. So those are supposed to pop up if there's a big outage or something like that to let everyone internally know what's going on. Um, uh, the SRE group, um, you know, we send our postmortems once they're written up to the, the entire SRE group so we can read them. I know there was an outage just like, what was it, on Friday or something while we were here, and an email went out, oh, blah, 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 this system is down, we're working on it. So it'll be email. Um, we all use IRC internally still, um, so word will spread through IRC. So yeah, I guess there are two different groups, right? There, there would be engineering, um, and we have all our back channels and way of, ways of chatting. Um, and then there are the people who might not be so technical, so sales, legal, finance, marketing. Um, I, 
can't remember the last time offhand we've had a system outage that would affect them because they're largely going to be using Google Docs or um, maybe even something offline. So uh, that's a good question. How do we communicate with people who aren't engineers? I don't know. It's, it would be through our support org, um, and we're sort of not in that organization, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, emails to the companies occasionally. Um, we have an internal web page that pretty much people use as their defaults. There might be a notification there, things along those lines. So I meant to mention it a little earlier. I was talking to Mike Dodge, and I can't remember um, if this is still the case or not. But I know for a little bit, uh, like for public communications, I, I think, and someone else from Facebook might be able to correct me, um, uh, Facebook was using uh, WordPress VIP for a little bit. Um, and you know a bunch of us have WordPress blogs or whatever. And WordPress VIP sounds really expensive. It's like $5,000 a month or even more than that or something, which is nothing to Facebook. But guess what? It's a totally separate infrastructure that if they're having problems with their infrastructure, they can send a message to everyone else and just say, look, there's this problem. We're working on it, which I think is really clever. Questions? Thank you very much, Ed. All right. Thank you.